Welcome to AUSA's Army Matters Podcast, focusing on what's important to the total Army community. We bring vital Army conversations and interviews on issues relevant to soldiers, military families, and all of you amazing Army supporters. Rotating each week, our show includes Soldier Today, Leading Great Teams, Family Voices, and Thought Leaders. Let's tune into the show. The silence was unnerving after several days at sea, crossing from America with the constant grinding of the ship's engines. Quiet now in the Atlantic waters off North Africa, but it didn't last long. In the early hours, bells clanged and then soldiers heard an anchor's chains rattle, barked orders, heavy and frantic footsteps, power winches whirring as they started to lower landing craft into the white-capped water. The United States. 24-year-old Lieutenant Maurice Footsie Britt, to his surprise, heard the voice of President Franklin D. Roosevelt announced the invasion of North Africa had already begun. Britt figured they had jumped the gun a little. They were still eight miles from shore. The blonde-haired Britt, all 220 pounds of him, took his place in his landing craft. Finally, the craft headed toward the shore. The seas as far as the horizon were dotted with transports. Britt belonged to the 3rd Division's 30th Infantry Regiment, whose motto was, Our Country, Not Ourselves. He was one of 35,000 Green American troops in Western Task Force, commanded by General George S. Patton, attacking French Morocco and Algeria. Dawn was now breaking. In the far distance, men could make out the steeple of a Catholic church rising above the Port of Fidela. There was sound of machine gun fire. Bright red tracers sped across the lightning sky. Britt heard the drone of French bombers and then saw huge fountains of spray as bombs crashed into the sea. He suddenly had a sickening feeling. The men in those bombers were trying to kill them. Britt's landing craft ground to shore. Men began to unload it, but then there was a deafening rattle of fire. Britt looked up and saw a French plane diving right towards him. Hello, everyone. I'm Joe Craig, and welcome to today's episode of Army Matters. My guest today is Alex Kershaw, the author of the just-released book, Against All Odds, a true story of ultimate courage and survival in World War II. Millions of men in nearly 90 divisions fought in the Second World War. One of those, 3rd Infantry Division, stands apart for its heroism and its feats. The 3rd Division fought the Nazis on every European and Mediterranean front and ended with the most Medal of Honor recipients of all units. Alex's book details four of the unit's members, former professional football player Morris Footsie Britt, babyface Texan Audie Murphy, West Point dropout Michael Daly, and department store manager turned officer Keith Ware. Alex is here today to talk about their individual stories, the book, and the concept of heroism. Welcome to the podcast, Alex. That's great to be with you. You've written a lot of books about World War II history, including The Liberator. This new one's interesting because it traces the history of the 3rd Infantry Division through the course of the war by telling the stories of four men that received the Medal of Honor. What was it about this unit that made you want to devote an entire book about it? I think because they were such a, a great unit and uh, not a lot of people that really appreciate the extent to which they contributed to uh, victory in Western Europe. I mean, they they lost the most men of any U.S. division. They spent longer in combat in Europe and amazingly had by far the largest number of Medal of Honor recipients from the third ID. They went from the beginning right to the end and uh, had some amazing fighters. And I thought, hey, this is a, a hell of a story. There was an interesting detail in the book that uh, I think could surprise a lot of people, especially fans of uh, Band of Brothers. Can you just tell us a little of the story of uh, the Berktus Garden? Well, everyone thinks that the guys that won the war, the Screaming Eagles, I think they spent like maybe 120 days on the line and the Third ID spent way, way longer than that. But anyway, they had two medals of honor and the Third ID 36 during the war, I believe. They didn't liberate Berkshire's Garden. The third ID made damn sure that they got there because they'd, they'd been there at the very, very beginning and they were utterly 
convinced that they, above anybody else, should be there right at the end. And they were. They were the actual American troops that actually liberated Berchtesgaden, not the Screaming Eagles. Right. It was theirs by right, theirs by destiny, they felt. As you say, you know, the division went through the entire course of the war and had so many Medal of Honor recipients. I want to talk about the four men that you profile in the book and just kind of introduce them to the audience. Would you start first with uh, Morris Footsy Britt and tell us a little bit more about him? Yeah, he is in the 30th Infantry Regiment. He came from Arkansas and uh, was a really all but one guy that I write about came from very impoverished backgrounds and uh, dealt with a hell of a lot of hardship and loss of parents, et cetera, early in life. So they were pretty, pretty tough by the time they got to Europe. But FTSE Brit was a star athlete at the University of Arkansas and actually played um, in the NFL for the Detroit Lions. So was a hell of an athlete and actually became the first U.S. soldier in World War II to earn every medal that you could win in World War II. So that's by that I mean the Bronze Star, Silver Star, DSC, and the Medal of Honor. So he was a hell of a guy and uh, unfortunately had his arm blown off at Enzio in early 1944 and could never play in the NFL again, but was just incredible. You think about that, you've got a, a star on the athletic field and a, a real-life superhero on the battlefield. So he, he was quite a character. Right. And next you had uh, two men who were serving in the 15th Infantry Regiment. Uh, one was quite well known, uh, the other less so. I chose Audie Murphy because he was in the 15th and I, I wanted to sort of follow him just because I was fascinated by him and also because I, I know that fans of World War II might want to hitch on to his name. And uh, he was a kind of vehicle for taking you through the third ID history and also because he was in the 15th Infantry Regiment and three of my four guys fought in that regiment. So I I don't need to talk too much about Audie Murphy, born in Texas, cotton-picking country, very, very, very hard upbringing, father abandoned the family, very young, lied about his age to try and get into the U.S. military and landed, uh, you know, he was, his company commander was a guy called Keith Ware and when they landed in Sicily, B Company on the 10th of July, 1943. And, you know, he basically pulled them off the line because he said, I'm not going to get any kids getting killed under my command because Murphy looks so, so young. He, Ware actually said that he looked about 13 or 14. And if you look at photographs, even when Murphy receives the Medal of Honor in June of 1945, he, he still looks younger than his actual age at that point, which was just, uh, you know, 20 years old. He, he had a very, very youthful, he was quite a slight character, very youthful appearance. So Morris Britt's one guy, um, Audie Murphy, and then Keith Ware, who came from Colorado, and uh, I believe is the only draftee in the U.S. military history to rise to the rank of general officer. So there have been, you know, people that joined the National Guard and others that were in the U.S., military, so to speak, before the war that reached all the way to that rank. But I believe uh, that he was the only guy that was drafted from a, a pen pusher job in California, any guy that was drafted into the Second World War that ended up becoming a, a general officer. He was the only guy that I write about that stayed in the military and ended up commanding the big red one in, in uh, Vietnam and was his helicopter was shot down in 1968 and he was killed. The irony of a guy that had never thought about joining the military, was drafted, was a superb officer, rose through the ranks, loved serving, and um, ended up receiving the Medal of Honor in World War II and then dying in, Viet in Vietnam. Actually, he was killed in Cambodia. So that's the four. That's the, the, the quadruple, um, Murphy, Brit, uh, and Ware. But there's another guy we haven't talked about, Michael Daly, who we can talk about. That's an interesting connection because he originally entered the war not with the third ID, but with the Big Red One. So who was he and how did he make that change? Well, he was a sort of devout Irish Catholic and he was at West Point and he really didn't like West Point a lot. He had issues with the sort of very strict regimentation, uh, which you'd expect at West Point or any, anywhere like that. But right. and he, there were some issues, you know, he didn't like some of the hazing. He dropped out of, um, decided to leave West Point and joined 
the first ID as a private, and he was in the 18th Infantry Regiment on Omaha Beach on June the 6th, 1944. And basically, his father was very highly decorated World War I veteran. He, his father was a full colonel in commanding a regiment in World War II in Europe. And so here we have father and son both serving in in the European theater, and Michael Daly was a star. I mean, he you know you don't know what, how people are going to perform in combat and proved to be an exceptional soldier and was promoted and then I think wounded near Arkham in fall of 1944 and then sent back to England. He recovered and because his father was on very close terms with Alexander Patch, who was Senate Army commander, it was arranged for Michael Daly to become uh, an aide to Patch and he did so and then made it pretty clear to Patch that he didn't want to be, you know, driving generals around for the rest of the war and and asked to be sent back into the infantry and, and got his wish and ended up in the 15th Infantry Regiment with Keith Ware and uh, Audie Murphy and then received the Medal of Honor for actions on the 17th of April 1944 in Nuremberg where he basically took out several machine gun nests single-handedly and led his company, he was a company commander, believe it or not, in Nuremberg, uh, a company of the 15th Infantry Regiment, and very badly wounded the day after he performed the actions for which he would later receive the medal. He was shot through the face and was very, very lucky to survive. He was lying in a pile of rocks and rubble in the center of Nuremberg and unbelievably pulled that pencil out of his combat jacket and stuck it down his throat and performed a kind of basic tracheotomy on himself and had he not been able to do that, he probably would have choked to death on his blood. Uh, it was a hell of an officer, a hell of a hell of a warrior, mm-hmm. and then went back to Connecticut and was in a sort of parade, sat beside his father in a car, you know, returning superhero, and uh, later said uh, in an interview many later, years later said he wished his father had received the Medal of Honor and not him. He didn't think that he'd done anything particularly special or a hell of a lot of guys that had served with him that had uh, been very, very courageous. What would you say was the common trait among the men that allowed them to perform these feats? I'd say one of the things that all the guys I write about had in common was that they weren't obviously in combat leading others to gain medals. They were just trying to do their job, and they realized at key critical moments that if they had to do it if they wanted to save lives, and they, they were part of that very special breed of combat soldiers uh, then and now and throughout history that were prepared to put their lives on the line frequently so that the job got done because otherwise a hell of a lot of guys that they were in charge of right. eventually would have been killed. Thankfully, we had guys like that to do it. Yeah, they helped us win the war with that attitude. After the break, we'll continue talking with Alex about how these four men survived all sorts of obstacles. Have you purchased your AUSA swag yet? Be proud to show your support for AUSA which in turn shows your support for the U.S. Army and our soldiers. Check out all AUSA swag at shop.ausa.org. We're back with author Alex Kershaw. He's the author of the book Against All Odds, a true story of ultimate courage and survival in World War II. Now, Alex, I'd like to dive deeper into the title of the book. Can you give us a sense of what the odds were actually like for a frontline soldier in World War II? Well, I think if you, you know, if you found yourself in um, a Morris Britt's unit, the 30th Infantry Regiment, landing in November 1942 in North Africa, um, the odds of you being in uh, alive from his company or any other company in that regiment, it would have been a miracle. Uh, I think Audie Murphy didn't go from North Africa. He went from Sicily, and he was pulled off the line because he they'd learned that he'd been recommended for the medal. And, you know, you didn't want guys who were being put up for the Medal of Honor being killed in combat. They were much more useful as, as live heroes, not not dead ones. The likelihood of you being killed or wounded, I mean, as an officer, you probably had, you know, in um, late 1944, 45, you had... Uh, probably a month, maybe a month or two, if you're an officer, maybe, you know, in Normandy, two weeks was the sort of average, I think, soldiers knew. You, the best thing that you could hope for was a, either a, 
a very painless death or to get a million dollar wound and uh, and be sent home, which meant, you know, a serious wound. And Murphy was wounded twice, the second time badly. He had several pounds of flesh taken out of his buttock uh, in a hospital in the south of France after he'd been hit by a sniper. He, the wound became gangrenous, but they put him back on the line, you know, it's like, mm-hmm. you can imagine, um, even if you had what you thought was a pretty serious wound, then you'd be back. So I, I just think that it was impossible to have really any kind of rational hope that you would uh, get to the end of the war in one piece without being wounded or or killed. When you're talking about that level of attrition and turnover, accomplishments of men, especially like Ware and Murphy, when you consider that you know Army psychologists are saying that basically you can't count on a soldier being combat effective after more than 200 days of action. And they, the yeah. length of time that uh, some of these men served uh, facing what they faced, it, it is uh, quite astounding. I think that report that you're referring to, I think there was some words used in that report which said that, you know, basically no man is a superman. Your body and your mind can only take so much. And, and yet we're talking about Murphy and Ware and there were many other men in the European theater in World War II that went for longer than 200 days in combat. They carried on, and they, that seems to me to be a miracle. I mean, it's, you know, how do you explain that someone goes beyond what is supposed to be the breaking point and still functions? The things that they were facing, as we referenced, you know, just atrocious. And throughout the book, I mean, you have very descriptive, uh, gripping scenes of, of combat throughout. And I know that you can't compare Valor, but is there one or two stories that really particularly resonated with you? I follow the four guys that we're talking about, but I also mention a half a dozen at least other guys that received the Medal of Honor because they were in the same battles. A guy called Tomanak, people might recognize his name. He was on a burning tank and as it rolled down a hill and carried on firing. The thing about the incidents that you come across is that they're almost unbelievable. I mean, Murphy himself stood on a burning tank for a maybe an hour and uh, just kept firing a machine gun as wave after wave of Germans approached him. You know, he was wounded, finally got off the the tank and uh, pulled back and then regrouped part of Company B that he belonged to and then attacked the Germans again. And it's almost unrealistic when you look at what these guys did. And I, I think they were just so in the moment that their adrenaline, their determination, their, they were in supreme action. And... It's almost as if you're talking about supreme athletes. It's almost like watching a superb Lionel Messi score a goal or you know Michael Jordan. That level of performance that it sort of seems otherworldly. You know, it really is. Certainly right. to me, as someone that's never been near a war, I just can't imagine the the physical, mental, and emotional, psychological strain of doing what these guys did. And so, yeah, superhuman almost. Just to wrap this up, um, I'm wondering if you could talk about uh, you know the costs and how FTSE Brit, Audie Murphy, Ware and Daly, you know, how did they adjust to post-war life? What really impressed me was that even though they did, in Murphy's case, suffer a lot from what was then called battle fatigue, and in Michael Daly's case, he, you know, he he liked to have a good drink for several years after the war and felt a little bit quite directionless and had a hard time. Um, readjusting in some ways to peace. All the four guys I write about had eventually very productive lives, even though Murphy, you know, died early in a plane crash. I think he was 46 years old. And yet they were these guys, you'd imagine that they would have just gone home and drank themselves to death and been a, a complete wrecks, but they were made of really, there was something inside them that was very strong and, uh, they came back, and even though they'd been through hell, they contributed. They had had families and, um, you know, very productive lives. They gave a lot back to the U.S. and their communities. And Morris Britt became lieutenant governor of Arkansas. Uh, Michael Daly was very active in his community and very active with helping support veterans at the end of their life, etc. What impressed me most was just how much they were able to give after the war, having already given everything they possibly could during it. It was just as awe-inspiring to see how how well they behaved 
and how productive they were. They battled through and, and made the most of their lives, which is what I found ultimately most inspiring. Yeah, well, you certainly uh, have written a very inspiring book here, and it's a great testament to these men's uh, service, both uh, in the war and back in the civilian world. So I want to thank you for writing the book, and I want to thank you uh, for being our guest here today. Thank you so much. And uh, listeners, I want to remind you that uh, Alex Kershaw's new book is Against All Odds, a true story of ultimate courage and survival in World War II. So thanks again, Alex. Thanks a lot. We've been chatting with Alex Kershaw, whose new book, Against All Odds, is now available in bookstores and online. I'm Joe Craig, and thanks for listening. To all our listeners, thanks for joining us. Be sure to subscribe to the Army Matters podcast on iTunes and everywhere podcasts are found. The Army Matters podcast series is brought to you by the Association of the United States Army, the U.S. Army's professional association, member-supported, Army-connected. Visit us at AUSA.org for more information or to become a member. Your membership helps AUSA continue to carry out its mission to educate, inform, and connect with the total Army, our industry partners, and our supporters of a strong national defense. For questions or to provide topic recommendations, email us at podcast at AUSA.org. Have a great Army day. Hua.